أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful, the one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon his pure and beloved messenger, the peak of his creation, the symbol of humanity, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. And his immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited savior, Al Imam Al Mahdi, Ajallahu Ta'ala Faraja. May Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Wa ala al arwah al lati hallat bifinai. عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار Peace be upon you O master of the martyrs O master of the free O master of the worshippers O master of those who sacrifice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran in Surah An-Nisa, verse 103, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna salata kanat ala al-mu'minina kitaban mawquta. Indeed, prayer has been an obligation on the believers at stated times. There is no doubt that prayer is one of the pillars of our deen, religion and faith. There is no daily ritual that is more important than prayer. There are over 33 verses in the Holy Quran that talk about salah and the significance of salah and that it is a quality of the believers. You cannot be a true believer without praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have a narration from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi that highlights the significance of prayer. In this hadith, the Prophet states, الكفر, What separates belief and disbelief? Iman and kufr. Tarku salah, abandoning your prayer. If you know the value of prayer, you commit to your salah, you're a believer. If you abandon salah without an excuse, then you're not a believer. In another hadith, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam states, Ta'ahadu amra salah wa hafidhu alayha. Be observant of your prayer. Give it what it deserves. Wastakthiru minha. Pray as much as you're able to. Bring yourself closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through prayer. Fa'innaha kanat ala al mu'minina kitaban mawquta. He cites this verse in Surah An Nisa. Because it's an obligation on the believers at set times to pray. Then the Imam السلام, states, Do you not hear the response of the people of hell when they were asked, Ma salakakum fi saqar? This is in Surah Al Muddathir. What brought you to saqar, this miserable place in hell? They said, We were not amongst those who would pray. We abandoned all forms of worship and prayer to the one God. In a third hadith, the Prophet ﷺ states, the one who abandons his salah, such that the time expires, min ghayri udrin, without a legitimate excuse. Sometimes you forget. You get caught up with work, and you forget to pray. It's not deliberate. But if you know that salah is wajib, you know it's important and you deliberately skip it. The Prophet states, فَقَدْ حَبِطَ عَمَلُهُ Your other good deeds will, will not have any value because salah is the pillar of faith. You bring down the pillar, the whole building comes down. The structure comes down crumbling. Then he says, that which separates between iman and kufr is prayer, not praying. Therefore, there is no doubt 
that abandoning salah is a major sin according to the Holy Quran and the hadith of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. To the point that abandoning salah, the sin of abandoning salah is greater than the sin of adultery. One companion of the sixth Imam of Ahlul Bayt, Al Imam Ja'far al Sadiq, السلام, asked him, He says, Oh Imam, the one who commits adultery, we can still call him a believer. He's not a kafir, right? Yes, he's sinful, but he's not a disbeliever. How come the one who abandons salah, does not pray, is not a believer? The Imam السلام, told him there's a difference between the two. The one who commits adultery, it's because of the temptation. Sometimes your physical carnal desires overwhelm you and God forbid you commit a sin. You believe in God, you're trying to respect the law of God, but sometimes desires can overcome us to varying degrees. The person can still be a believer. The one who commits this indecent act is not a kafir. But then the Imam Ali Salam comments by saying the one who abandons his salah what desire is pulling him towards the abandonment of salah? When it comes to fasting, you have the desire of food. Sometimes you're really hungry, you break your fast. See, with all these sins, there's a desire pushing you. You listen to music, there's a desire to listen to music. There's a desire to look at the opposite gender. See, you have this built-in desire. But what desire causes you to skip your salah? The Imam states the reason why people would skip salah, those of course who know that it's wajib, some people don't know, but those who know that it's mandatory, istighfafan biha, because they take Allah lightly. They take their creator lightly. They are negligent towards their creator. They have no respect for their creator. That's why it's a type of disbelief. Now today, my dear brothers and sisters, we hear many different types of questions about prayer. Why are we obligated to pray? Why does God punish me for not praying? There are some people who are coming with these questions. Some people are saying Allah is self-sufficient. Some atheists even pose this objection to us. And they accuse God of being selfish. Why does your God insist on being worshipped? And he punishes you if you don't worship him. What's the big deal? So what if you don't pray? This indicates that there's a problem with your God. These are some of the misconceptions that they are concocting. And there are many people in our community who are confused by these misconceptions. So does God need your prayers? Many people are under the impression that God needs my prayer. Okay, I know it's good to pray. But if I don't pray, why does he punish me then? It means that he needs something out of my prayer. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense for him to punish me. In our discussion tonight, we'd like to explore this very important question. Now, there are many dimensions to this question. There are many different answers that it can be given. But we'll focus on one angle and offering answers to this very important objection or question. We begin by examining a very important point here. We must understand one reality about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is like the sun. The sun does not lose anything if you don't benefit from it. Let's say I have a house and I'd like to seal all my windows so I don't get any sunlight. I can do that. I have the free will to do that. Does that affect the sun in any way? In fact, if all the inhabitants of the earth, in fact, if the planet itself, earth, had a way to block sunlight, does that affect the sun in any way? Does it even come close to scratching the sun's presence and existence? The sun does not need anyone here on earth. Whether you benefit from the sun or not, the sun does its job. It's still an amazing star that gives off warmth, energy, light. If everyone on earth decides to reject sunlight by blocking sunlight, that does not affect the sun and iota. The sun does not need you. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need our prayers. Whether we pray or not, it doesn't impact him in any way. In Surah Ibrahim verse 8, 
Prophet Musa السلام, tells his people who kept rejecting the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقَالَ مُوسَى إِن تَكْفُرُوا أَنْتُمْ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا Musa said, if you decide to disbelieve in God, reject God, not you, everyone on earth. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَنِيٌّ حَمِيدٌ Allah is ghani, self-sufficient, hamid. He is innately praiseworthy. If there's not a single human being to praise God on earth, to pray to God, that does not impact Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way. He's the creator. He's above all limitations. He created the universe. He doesn't need anyone. Don't think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs your prayers. By the way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not compare himself to anything. Because nothing is like him. You can't compare God to anything. You can compare one thing to another if there is some sort of similarity. There's nothing close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing similar to Allah. Nothing in the universe, as great as it can be, is like God. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in Surah Shura, verse 11, Laysa kamithlihi shay. Very simple. There's nothing like him. However, Sometimes we humans, we need an example to bring a concept closer to our minds. To give us an example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself as being light. Technically, he's not light because the light that we know is still a physical entity. You've got photons traveling through space. Allah is above all these limitations. But if it's the closest thing you can compare Allah to. If you wanted to theoretically use a figure of speech and compare God to something, Allah describes himself as being light in Surah An-Nur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in Surah An-Nur, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. This light is shining. You can choose to benefit from this light or not. If you don't, it's your loss. Not the loss of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now Allah being the light of the heavens of the earth means that he's the ultimate guide in the universe. He guides everything physically, spiritually. Every atom in space is guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every bit of matter in space is guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself as being the light when he's communicating to us. Because light has some very special properties or features. One, light is the most beautiful thing you can see around you. Without it, there's no beauty, there's no color, it's just utter darkness, right? The beautiful scenes that you see, it's possible, are made possible for you to see them through light. Allah gives beauty, he shines in the whole universe. Number two, light is the fastest thing in existence. Scientists, up until now, they don't know of anything that can travel faster than the speed of light. But what's beautiful about light is that despite its fast speed, it doesn't harm you. That's because the photons don't have any mass. So when light is bombarding you at a very, very fast speed, 300,000 kilometers per second. Imagine something is hitting you at that speed, right? You'd think it should destroy you, burn you, do something to you, but light does not harm you. You don't even feel it. Unless it's a very concentrated laser beam, yes, you feel it. But natural light, you don't really feel it. It doesn't, you know, bump into you, harming you. That's because photons have no mass. If it had mass, it would kill everything. So the beautiful thing about light is that while it's so fast, it's so gentle. It just reminds you of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's so powerful. Allah is the ultimate power, but he's gentle towards the human being. That's just amazing. The third feature about light is that it carries energy. Another feature about sunlight specifically is that it kills many different types of microbes and harmful organisms here on earth. Allah is indeed the light of the universe. And everything that's connected to Allah is also considered as being light. The Quran is light, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the Quran in the Quran as being the nur. nur anzalna. Why? Because it's the speech of Allah. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is light. 
وسراجا منيرا Islam is the light the imams of ahlul bayt are light they illuminate why everything that's associated with god attributed to allah everything that represents allah is considered light because allah is the ultimate light in this universe faith is also light right iman in your heart is a light may allah illuminate our hearts and minds with his faith with his iman the faith in him there's a beautiful passage in dua al joshan al kabir in which we talk about this light we say addressing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ya nur al nur o oh, the light of light ya munawwar al nur or o oh, oh, the one who makes light light ya khaliq al nur the creator of light ya mudabbir al nur the one who manages light ya muqaddir al nur the one who prescribes light ya nur kull nur the light of every light ya nur an qabla kull nur o oh, light before every light ya nur an ba'da kull nur o oh, light after every light ya nur an fawqa kull nur o oh, light above every light ya nur an laysa kamithlihi nur but here's the fundamental point o oh, light nothing is like this light o oh, light whose nothing is like this light indeed allah is the light of the heavens and the earth so allah doesn't need your prayers he's the ultimate light of the universe whether you pray or not allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that light if you don't pray you miss out on that special light it's important to understand this fundamental point the second point over here is that the more you come to know allah his attributes the more you benefit from his light an example is solar power in the past people did not know that the sun gives such amazing energy and that you could actually use this energy it was in 1839 that a young french physicist by the name of edmond becquerel he actually was the one to discover the photovoltaic effect that you can actually capture that you can actually capture sunlight and benefit from it. Look at the world today. Now see how much people are benefiting from the sun. You know how much energy the sun generates? One year of solar power on your home when you install those solar panels on the roof is like saving 18,000 miles of driving. 1 million full smartphone charges. Look at all this energy. 12,500 pounds of carbon emission, 4,000 or 8,000 pounds of coal, 122 trees just for one house. Look at all this energy. Now if you want to quantify that energy and see how much it is, the sun sends every single hour, not day or year, every single hour 430 quintillion joules of energy let's put this into perspective how much energy is that if you gather all the humans all the humans on the planet and you want to see how much energy they use in one year 365 days all the humans on earth how much energy do we use the electricity that we use the cars that we use the airplanes the factories you name it we use a lot of energy Humans every single year use about 410 quintillion joules of energy. The sun in one hour generates more energy than what human beings use in one year. Can you imagine? 60 minutes in 60 minutes the sun gives energy to earth more than what humans use in one full year. Now we're finding ways to capture that energy. See what ma'rifa can do, see what science and knowledge can do. The sun's there, has been there for billions of years, but recently the human being has discovered how to make use of that light. It's the same with Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the infinite light. The more you come to know him, the more you worship him, the more you give him from your time, the more you'll discover ways to benefit from his light. in ways that you did not even know existed before 
1,000 years ago, people did not even know that the sun can generate this type of energy that can become electricity. People did not even know that. They did not even have that awareness, but now we do. The closer you get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you contemplate His greatness and the greatness of His creation, and the more you come to know Him, and the more you feel safe with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you trust Allah, the more you fear Allah and love God, the more you have piety, the more ways you discover to benefit from that light. Such that if you're thrown in the darkest place in the universe, let's say you get sucked up by some black hole somewhere, you still have the light of Allah shining in your heart. Nothing at that point can bring you down because you are connected to the ultimate source of light. So what happens if I don't? I don't want to pray. I don't want to connect myself to this light. What's the real punishment? What kind of punishment do I get? My dear brothers and sisters, in reality, in reality, if you analyze the spirit of Quran and the spirit of the hadith of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, you come to the realization that the real punishment for the one who doesn't worship God is being away from God. That's the real punishment. Don't we read every Thursday night in the beautiful blessed dua of Kumail in which the Imam Islam describes vividly to us this reality. The Imam states, Sabartu ala adabik. Habni, sabartu ala adabik. Oh Allah, let's assume I can handle your punishment in hell. Fakayfa asbiru ala firaqik. But oh God, how do I have the patience to be separated from you? Firaq means separation. I'm separated from your mercy, from your satisfaction. I can handle hell, assuming I can handle hell. And we know no one can handle hell. Look at the verses of the Quran. No one can handle the fire of hell. The Imam says, granted, I can handle it. How can I handle being separated from you? وَهَبْنِي صَبَرْتُ عَلَىٰ حَرِّ نَارِكِ فَكَيْفَ أَصْبِرُ عَنِ النَّظَرِ إِلَىٰ كَرَامَتِكِ Oh Allah, granted that I can handle the heat of your hell, of your nar. But how can I have the patience to handle an anadari ila karamatik? To being viewed by you favorably or seeing your honor and glory. To be away from your karama, from your honor and glory. I don't have the patience, Ya Allah. In other words, Imam Ali alayhi salam is teaching us, look, the real punishment is not hell. The real punishment for disobeying God and turning against God is to be separated from Allah. That is the real punishment. Those who don't pray and are negligent with their prayers, they're punishing their own selves by being separated from God. Prayer is extremely important. It's the pillar of our faith. Yes, there are other ways of communicating with God, but the pillar is salah. One example that I can share with you here is jealousy and other moral vices. Jealousy is a vice and it's sinful. We have many narrations that warn us against jealousy. Now what's the punishment for jealousy? One hadith states, jealousy eats your faith just like fire devours wood. Have you seen how fire devours wood and consumes it? That's what jealousy does to your iman. Now what's the ultimate punishment of jealousy? It's destroying your own self. Jealous people are not comfortable. They don't enjoy the blessings that they have. They're constantly obsessed with what, with what others have. See, the punishment for a jealous person doesn't need to be an external punishment. It's an internal punishment. Jealousy removes the comfort from your heart. The same with anger and other vices. People who are angry, before they inflict damage on other people, they damage their own selves. Sometimes you don't need to punish an angry person. The angry person is already punishing himself. He's not really enjoying his life. He's causing stress for himself. He becomes angry and he makes inappropriate decisions. And then he's regretful. It's enough of a punishment. Believe me, some angry people, I've seen them. You really don't need to punish them for anything that they've done. 
because they have already punished themselves. Allah is not selfish. He's the source of all goodness. He wants us to benefit from this source. If we don't, it's our loss. That's our punishment. But people don't get this. So you have to motivate people in a different way. Yes, we don't deny hell. Hell does exist. There are some people, they're so evil, they must go to hell. But Allah did not create us to take us to hell. We sometimes create our own hellfire. And so the real punishment for salah is to be away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about this, my dear brothers and sisters. So now the question is, why do I need to offer this formal prayer, the five daily prayers? I can be sleeping on my bed and I speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, that's informal prayer, that's dua. It's highly recommended to always speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever you're thinking with yourself, you're making a decision, you're reviewing your day, speak to Allah. Make Allah your best friend, your intimate friend. But that does not replace formal prayer. Formal prayer must always be there. And then in addition to the formal prayer, you can informally speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reason is for this formal prayer to be effective, it must be appropriate and formal. That's because we need to know how to interact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take this as an example. Let's say you have a company. In that company, you have a relationship between the employees and a boss, right? The employer and the employees. There are guidelines about their positions, how they communicate with one another. Where is their jurisdiction? What are their obligations? You as the employee, what's your obligation? How do you interact with others in the company? There are guidelines for this, right? And it's formalized. It's right on paper. When you go and you work somewhere, you must consent to many conditions. You must accept them. Now, is this good or bad? Someone could say, hey, I don't need this relationship with my boss, with other people in the company, with my manager. Let's just do everything informally. It's okay. I'll figure it out. No, that doesn't work. It must be written. You must have written guidelines. Otherwise, the company is not going to be functional. You need to know the guidelines. Or let's say you have a school. You've got teachers. You've got a principal. You've got a janitor. You've got children. You need to have guidelines. How do we interact with one another in the school? You cannot just keep everything informal. Yes, there is time for informal interaction. After class ends, you want to go up to your teacher and Chat maybe during recess, during lunchtime, fine. You have that informal time. But you also need that formal component. Without it, you cannot, have, you cannot have a healthy institution, a healthy system. Our daily five prayers are a guideline. It's a formal prayer that shows you how to, how to interact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But of course, you have to know the meanings of salah. One problem is that we're not really aware of the meanings of salah. Prayer lets you take Allah seriously. It allows you to better understand His position as your creator, to better understand your role and obligations as the created. If you don't know the relationship you know, with your boss, you'll encroach on his rights, on the rights of others. There will be chaos. But proper prayer puts you in place. That's why the Holy Quran states, in tanha anil wal munkar. This formal, proper prayer, if you observe its conditions, of course, it will prevent you from vice, from corruption, from deviations. So you need that formal prayer. It organizes your relationship with Allah. And then outside of this formal prayer, you can have all the informal prayer that you want. Now, one final point here, my dear brothers and sisters, about the punishment for not praying. Look, let's be realistic here. We don't know many things about this life, about existence. In Surah al rum verse 7, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, min al -hayat al -dunya. People simply know the outward aspect of this world. But they completely are heedless of the hereafter. We don't know much about this life and the system of God. We know one thing, Allah owns us and we ought to obey Him. Whether we understand the philosophy of prayer or not, 
We still have to obey our creator. After knowing intellectually that I have a creator and he wants this prayer from me, I respect that. I obey that. If I disobey that, he's justified in punishing me because I am violating an important command in the universe. I don't have to understand everything. What do I understand? Go to a complex company. You think you know how they run it? Go to Apple today, Facebook, Google, right? And let's say it's not your area of expertise. You think within, within a few hours you're going to know how the system works? Our man-made institutions are very complex with so many variables. You want to understand the whole universe? You want to understand the greatness of your creator? We respect the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He owns us. He can dictate to us whatever he wants, whether we understand it or not. Why 17 units, not 18? It's up to him. He knows what's best for us. As his creation, we submit to him. Now, how do we benefit from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do we benefit from this light in the universe? Enhance the quality of your salah. We just pray robotically. Imam Hussein alayhi salam loved the salah. We commemorate the legacy of Imam Hussein on these nights. Imam Hussein on the night of Ashura, he asked Abu al-Fadl Abbas alayhi salam to go to these evil enemies and to ask them to delay the war because they wanted to attack Imam Hussein on the 9th of Muharram. Imam Hussein requested for them to delay it till the 10th. He told them, tell them I love prayer. I want to pray on this last night of my life. Allah knows how much I love salah. See, Imam Hussein knows the quality of salah. In Ziyarat al-Nahiya, we read this beautiful passage in which Imam al-Mahdi states, Tawil al-Ruku'i was sujood. Oh, Aba Abdullah, your ruku' was long. Your sujood was long. Ibn al-Zubair, who was not so friendly with Imam Hussein, he testifies. He says, I swear by Allah, do you know who they killed? They killed him while he was prolonged in his standing at night. He'd stand his entire night on his feet, supplicating to Allah. He would, for most of the days, he'd be fasting during the day. Imam Ali ibn al-Hussein and Imam Zain al-Abidin states, my father would pray during the day and night within a 24-hour period. 1,000 rakahs. Enhance the quality of your salah, my dear brothers and sisters. Love God and see Him as your ultimate hope. It's the love of God in the heart of Imam Hussein that brought Imam Hussein to victory on the day of Ashura. Ilahi rivan In those final moments, he did not complain. Oh Allah, I trust you. I'm satisfied with your will. Anta thiqati fi kulli karb. He said this on the day of Ashura. Oh Allah, I rely on you in every difficulty. Moments you're going to save me with shahada. Aghithni ya ghiyath al mustaghithin. Help me, O oh Allah. You help those who ask for help. Imam Hussein alayhi salam was in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One beautiful narration states that once Anas ibn Balik, he was with Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He's a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He says, I was in Mecca, Imam Hussein went to the grave of Lady Khadija alayhi salam. And he started to cry at the grave of Lady Khadija. Then he told Ibn Abbas, I want some privacy. He, he, he said to Anas, not Ibn Abbas. He said to Anas, I want some privacy. So he says, I kind of, you know, moved from, from that area. But I, I was intrigued. I was now curious, what does Hussein want to do? He says, I saw him standing in salah. And then I heard him saying the following, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Anta Mawlahu, Farham Ubaidan ilayka maljahu. O oh my Lord, O oh my Lord, you are his master and guardian. Who? A small servant who seeks refuge in you. See how Imam Hussein used to speak to Allah. Ya dal ma'ali alayka mu'atamadi. Tuba liman kunta anta mawlahu. Oh, the one with a lofty status. I rely on you. How lucky is the one for whom you are his master. Consider yourself lucky to have a Lord like Allah. 
طوبى لمن كان خائفا ارقا يشكو الى ذي الجلال بلواه How lucky is the one who's scared? He cannot sleep. He's got a problem. But he has you, O oh Allah, the Lord of the glory, to complain to. وَمَا بِهِ عَلَّةٌ وَلَا سُقْمٌ أَكْثَرُ مِنْ حُبِّهِ لِمَوْلَى And he doesn't have an illness more than his love for his master. Basically, the Imam is saying, My love for you, O oh Allah, is greater than all my pains, all my problems. I go through sicknesses, illnesses, problems, but my love trumps everything. My love dwarfs everything. إِذَا اشْتَكَى بَثَّهُ وَغُصَّتَهُ أَجَابَهُ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ لَبَّاهُ If he complains about his pains, Allah responds to him. Allah does respond to you. إِذَا ابْتَلَى بِالظَّلَامِ مُبْتَهِلًا أَكْرَمَهُ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ أَدْنَاهُ Whenever he goes through a trial, in the darkness, he supplicates to Allah. Allah will honor him and bring him closer. Anas ibn Manik states, after Imam Hussain said these lines of poetry, what happened? He hear, he heard a voice. He says, I heard a voice speaking to Hussain. لَبَّيْكَ لَبَّيْكَ أَنْتَ فِي كَنَفِي وَكُلَّمَا قُلْتَ قَدْ عَلِمْنَاهُ سَلَامُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ يَا أَبَا عَبْدِ اللَّهِ How Allah responds to you. We have heeded your call. We have heeded your call. You are in my protection, my servant. Everything you've said, we have come to know it. صوتك تشتاقه ملائكتي فحسبك الصوت قد سمعناه My angels, they love your voice, they miss your voice. It's sufficient, we've heard your voice. سلني بلا رغبة ولا رهب Ask me without any limitations. ولا حساب إني أنا الله No limitations for I am Allah. Ask me what you want. This is Aba Abdullah Hussein, and this is the relationship that he had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brothers and sisters, on such a night, we commemorate the legacy of Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. We know that Al-Hur, in the beginning, he was responsible for Imam Hussein alayhi salam not arriving Kufa. Ibn Ziyad sent him with 1,000 soldiers and they cut off the Imam from going to Kufa. But now it's the day of Ashura. Reality hits him. Strikes him. What's going on over here? He tells Umar ibn Sa'd. Because Umar ibn Sa'd was the main commander of the army. Hur was also a commander on one wing of the army. He tells him, Umar, أَمُقَاتِلٌ أَنْتَ هَذَا الرَّجُلٌ Are you really decided on killing this man? He said, yes, the least of which you're going to see limbs flying today. He says, no, why? Why are you fighting him? He made several offers. One of them is he'll go back. Omar said, it's not up to me. It's up to your Amir Ibn Ziyad. That's his command. Fight Hussein and we're going to fight him. La ilaha illallah. What happens to Al-Hur Ibn Yazid Al-Riyahi over here? There are moments in your life when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the opportunity to repent. Not everyone has the tawfiq to do repentance. So when, the, when an opportunity comes, take it. You may not know that another opportunity will come. You see Imam Hussein alayhi salam before he arrived Karbala. The very last village that he stopped at before arriving Karbala is the village of Qasr, Bani Muqatil. What happened in this village? Something very interesting happened here. When Imam Hussein alayhi salam reaches this village, they see a tent that was erected. It belonged to a man by the name of Ubaidullah ibn al-Hur al-Juhfi. So one of the Imam's companions went to him telling him, look, I have a gift for you. He says, gift? What kind of gift are you talking about? He says, this is Hussein. He's come here. Get up and support him. This is the best divine gift for you. You know what this man said? The man said, look, I swear by God, the only reason why I left Kufa is to avoid a situation like this. Because I know the people of Kufa betrayed Hussein. So I didn't want to stay in Kufa. On the one hand, I don't want to go and fight with him. There's a controversy. He's been betrayed. On the other hand, I don't want to see him betrayed in front of me and not do anything. Because he knew the Imam was on the haq. 
He says, so I just left Kufa, so I avoid seeing all of that. In other words, he was telling them, look, I'm not interested in supporting Imam Hussein. The Imam himself comes to meet him and invites him to support him. Come support the grandson of Rasulullah. Then the Imam Ali Salam tells him, you've had a bad past. The Imam wasn't exposing him. This was something known. You know, he had helped dictators, evil ones. He was also involved in looting and attacking caravans. The Imam is telling him, look, you've had a bad past. Now here's an opportunity for you to wash your sins. Come and do something productive. Stand with the Imam of your time. See, the Imam is giving him the opportunity to repent. What does he do? He says, here, take my horse. It's the best, fastest horse. You will not lose in the battle if you ride my horse and use my horse. And here's my sword. It's the sharpest of swords. You know what the Imam Ali Salam tells him? Subhanallah. How could you say this to your Imam? Here, take my sword. Here, take my horse. You think the Imam needs your horse? You think the Imam needs your sword? The Imam is looking for pure souls to join him. Because the Imam is compassionate. He wants others to join him. So they become eternalized in history. The Imam tells him, if you're greedy with your life, with your soul, then I don't need your horse. I don't, I don't need your source. I don't need your sword. He thought that the Imam was in need. The Imam was telling him, you're in need of shahada, of this tawfiq. He told him, but I'm not ready to die. It's a difficult trial. But Al-Hur is one of those men who teaches us despite the wrongdoings. Yes, I blocked Imam Hussein. I sided with Ibn Ziyad. I pledged allegiance to Ibn Ziyad. But now I'm willing to change that because Allah has given me the opportunity. That's why one of his friends on the day of Ashura, he sees Hur Ibn Yazid al-Riyahi trembling, shaking. He tells him, Hur, what's the matter? I regarded you as the Bravest of all warriors. Why is it that I see you trembling today? He says, I see myself between heaven and hell. It's clear to me. There's no way out right now. Heaven is on the side of Hussein, And hell is on the side of Ibn Ziyad and Yazid and Umar ibn Sa'd. And I've come to know that they want to kill Hussein. I now have to make a stance over here. I did not come to kill Hussein. Hussein is a good leader. Hussein is a righteous servant of God. And I see myself choosing between these two paths, between heaven and hell. And I swear by God, I shall never choose, choose anything over paradise. I shall not choose anything over heaven. Look at the trial over here. It's not easy. What are the people going to say? Oh, he chickened out. Oh, he became weak. Doesn't matter. Let people talk about you. Which shame is greater? People shaming you. And who? Disbelieving people, evil people, corrupt people. They're shaming you or are you being shamed by Allah and Rasulullah? Once a sister told me that my family mocks me when I don't listen to you me music. I'm trying to resist haram music. They mock me. They shame me. They say all sorts all sort of all sorts of inappropriate things to me. It's okay. Let them say that. How does Allah view you for resisting your desires? How does the Prophet view you? How does Imam al-Mahdi view you? That's what's important. Who cares about what the people say? If Hur wanted to care about what people said, he would have failed his test and he would have been cursed for eternity. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him. He makes that noble, courageous decision and he goes towards the camp of Imam Hussein salawatullahi alayhi. He mounts on his horse. He comes towards Aba Abdullah, but he had his hands on his head, indicating that he's surrendering. He's not here to fight. And then he would say, Allahumma ilayka anabtu fatub alayk. Oh Allah, I'm repenting to you. Accept my repentance. Forgive me. 
فقد أرعبت قلوب أوليائك وأولاد بنت نبيك Oh Allah, I cast terror in the hearts of the family of your prophet These believing men, I put terror in their hearts When I was in the Husam and I blocked them from going to Kufa Oh Allah, can you forgive me? Then he came to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. <laughs> he says, Ju'antu fidaka ibn Rasulullah. May my life be sacrificed to you, O Hussein. I am the one who stopped you from going to Kufa. And I am the one who brought you to this land. I am the one who caused part of this problem over here. But I honestly did not think that they were going to kill you. I did not really think that. And he was honest in what he said. I thought they'd accept your offer. One of your offers, I'll go back to Medina. I'll go to Yemen. I'll go someplace else. I thought they would accept your offer. But now I have realized what I have done. And I want to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَهَلْ تَرَى لِي مِنْ تَوْمَ Do you think there is room? For repentance, there is always room for repentance. The Imam Ali Salam states, "Yes, if you repent, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will forgive you." Anta al fi dunya wal akhirah. You are the free, O Hur. Through this repentance, you're re liberating yourself. At that point, he thanks Imam Al Hussein and he tells him, "My blessed, my beloved Imam." Because I was the one who caused this, give me the honor of being the first one to go and defend you. He goes into the battlefield and he gives a powerful speech. He rebukes them. He tells them, oh people, how come you don't accept the offer that Hussein has given you? Why are you insisting on killing him? Don't put yourself in this trap with God. If you kill him, you shall be doomed for eternity. You invited Al-Abd Salih, this righteous servant of Allah. You invited him. Now you turn against him. You promised him that you'd defend him. Now you turn against him. This is not right. And now look at what you've done to his family. You've blocked them from the water of Farat. And they're so thirsty right now. You must repent. You must stop what you're doing. There's still time. I invite you all to repent. Then he went into the battlefield when they rejected his offer. He said that I'm going to fight you and defend Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Inni ana al hurru wa ma'wa al zayfi. Adrabu fi a'naqikum bil sayfi. Do you know who I am? I am Hur. I am the refuge for the one who's a guest. I'm generous. I will kill you with my sword. Strike at your necks. And خَيْرِ مَنْ حَلَّ بِأَرْضِ الْخَيْفِ Hussein is the best human being on, the, in, on earth today. I am defending him. He fights valiantly, O oh believers, but they surround him from every direction. The swords come at him, the spears come at him. He kills many of them, but then in the end he is overwhelmed. When finally one of those evil enemies, O oh believers, comes towards Al-Hur and he strikes him. Al-Hur falls to the ground. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Imam al Hussein runs to this first shaheed in the battlefield. He reaches the body of Hur. He sees him in that miserable state. The Imam wipes the dust and the blood from his forehead, the sides of his forehead. And the Imam tells him, Anta hurrun kama sammatka ummuk, O Hur. Indeed, you are free, just like your mother named you. Hurrun fid dunya wal You became free in dunya. You liberated yourself and you shall be free on the day of judgment. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Wa sayalamu alladheena zalamu ala muhammadin ayyamun qalabiyan qalibun. Wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen. السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين اللهم عجل وليك الفرج 
وجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه واكشف عن غمه وحزنه يا الله اللهم اشف كل مريض اللهم اقض دين كل مدين اللهم اقض حوائج المحتاجين يا الله This is the moment of dua all, the, all those who are ill who've asked you for dua pray for them in these moments through the baraka of the majalis of Imam Hussein Allah answers our prayers اللهم ارزقنا شفاعة الحسين اللهم ارزقنا زيارة الحسين يا الله والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته